Hi guys, it's Laura and you're watching Laura X Annie. So today I'm here with a new video today and apologies I've got the flu. But I'm here with a sister series to the one I did last year, which was Romeo and Juliet, Understanding Romeo and Juliet. This time it's Understanding Hamlet. So I have all my notes here that are long. So we're tackling scene one and scene two. So let's get right into this. So Hamlet was written around the year 1600s in the final years of the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, who had been the monarch of England for more than 40 years and was then in her late 60s. The prospect of Elizabeth's death and the question of who would succeed her was a subject of grave anxiety at times, since Elizabeth had no children and the only person with a legitimate royal claim, James of Scotland, <laughs> was the son of Mary Queen of Scots and therefore re represented a political faction to which Elizabeth was opposed. But actually, when Elizabeth died in 1603, James did inherit the throne, becoming King James I. Little known fact. It is no surprise, then, that many of Shakespeare's plays from this period, including Hamlet, concern transfers of power from one monarch to the next. These plays focus particularly on the uncertainties, betrayals and upheavals that accompany such shifts in power, and, and the general sense of anxiety and fear that surround them. The situation Shakespeare presents at the beginning of Hamlet is that a strong and beloved king has died and the throne has been inherited not by his son as we might expect but by his brother because a lot of people think that Hamlet is like 19 in the play but he's not, he's actually 30. Um, still grieving the old king, no one knows yet what to expect from the new one and the guards outside the castle are fearful and suspicious. The supernatural appearance of the ghost on a chilling, misty night outside Elsinore Castle indicates immediately that something is wrong in Denmark. The ghost serves to enlarge the shadow King Hamlet casts across Denmark, indicating that something about his death has upset, upset the balance of nature. How wonderful! <laughs> The appearance of the ghost also gives physical form to the fearful anxiety that surrounds the transfer of power after the king's death, seeming to imply that the future of Desmond Mark is a dark and frightening one. Horatio in particular sees the ghost as an ill omen boding violence and turmoil in Denmark's, Denmark's future, comparing it to the supernatural omens that supposedly presaged the assassination of Julius Caesar in ancient Rome, and which Shakespeare had recently represented in Julius Caesar, which he'd written just very, just before this. Since her ratio proves to be right and the appearance of the ghost does precede the later tragedies of the play, the ghost functions as a kind of internal foreshadowing, implying tragedy not only to the audience but to the characters as well. Um, the scene also introduces the character of Horatio, who with the exception of the ghost is the only major character in the scene. Without sacrificing the forward flow of action or breaking the atmosphere of dread, Shakespeare establishes that Horatio is a consumered man who is also educated, intelligent and sceptical of supernatural events. Before he sees the ghost he insists, tush tush, twill not appear. Um, even after seeing it, he is reluctant um, to give full credence to stories of magic and mysticism. When Marcellus says that he has heard that the crowning, the crowning, the crowing of the cock has the power to dispel evil powers, so that no fairy tales nor which hath power to charm, Horatio replies, so have I heard and do in part believe it, emphasising the in part, if you know what I mean, like that was what was emphasised. But Horatio is not a blind rationalist either, and when he sees the ghost, he does not deny its existence. On the contrary, he's overwhelmed with terror. His ability to accept the truth at once, even when his predictions have been proved wrong, indicates the fundamental trustworthiness of his character. His reaction to the ghost functions to overcome the audience's sense of disbelief, since for a man as sceptical, intelligent and trustworthy as Horatio to believe in and fear the ghost is far more impressive and convincing than if it, its only witness had been a pair of superstitious watchmen. In this subtle way, Shakespeare uses Horatio to represent the audience's perspective throughout the scene. By overcoming Horatio's sceptical resistance, the ghost gains the audience's suspension of disbelief as well. So that's the whole of Act 1 where basically the ghost comes and basically is like, Hi, I'm the ghost of King Hamlet. Hello, hi there, how are you doing? And just scares the shit out of the Watchmen and Horatio. Um, and then on to scene 2 is when we first really meet Hamlet. Having established a dark, ghostly atmosphere in the first scene, Shakespeare devotes a second to the seemingly jovial court of the recently crowned King Claudius. If the area outside the castle is murky with the honour of dread and anxiety, the rooms inside the castle are devoted to an energetic attempt to banish that honour. As the king and as the king, the queen, and the courtiers desperately pretend that nothing is out of the ordinary. 
It's difficult to imagine a more convoluted family dynamic or a more out of balance political situation, but Claudius nevertheless preaches an ethic of balance to his courtiers, pledging to sustain and combine the sorrow he feels for the king's death and the joy he feels for his wedding in equal parts. Like, what a fucked up family, man. That's seriously, honestly, poor Hamlet. But despite Claudius's efforts, the merriment of the court seems superficial. Like, of course it does. <laughs> Hey, sorry about that. This is largely due to the fact that the idea of balance Claudius pledges to follow is unnatural. How is it possible to balance sorrow for a brother's death with happiness for having married a dead brother's wife? Claudius' speech is full of contradictory words, ideas, and phrases, beginning with Though yet of Hamlet, our late brother's death, the memory be green, which combines the idea of death and decay with the idea of greenery growth and renewal. Like, I mean, come on, mate. He also speaks of our sometime sister, now our queen, defeated joy, an auspicious and a dropping eye, mirth and funeral, and die in marriage. These ideas sit uneasily with one another, and Shakespeare uses this speech to give the audiences an uncomfortable first impression of Claudius. The negative impression is furthered when Claudius affects a fatherly role towards the bereaved Hamlet, advising him to stop grieving for his dead father and adapt to a new life in Denmark. Hamlet obviously does not want Claudius' advice and Claudius' motives in giving it are thoroughly suspect since, after all, Hamlet is the man who would have inferred the throne but had Claudius not snatched it from him. The result of all his blatant dishonesty is that this scene portrays as dire a situation in Denmark as the first scene does, where the first scene illustrates the fear and supernatural danger lurking in Denmark, the second hints at the corruption and weakness of the king and his court. The scene also furthers the idea that Denmark is somewhere unsound as a nation as Claudius declares that Fortinbras make his battle plans. Holding a weak supposal of our worth or thinking by our late dear brother's death, our state to be disjoint and out of frame. Prince Hamlet, devastated by his father's death and portrayed by his mother's marriage, is introduced as the only character who is unwilling to play along with Claudius's god attempt to mimic a healthy royal court. On the one hand, this may suggest that he is only the only honest character in the royal court. <laughs> the only person of high standing whose sensibilities are off, offended by what has happened in the aftermath of his father's death. <laughs> On the other hand, which is more likely, it also suggests, suggests that he is malcontent, someone who refuses to go along with the rest of the court for the sake of the greater good of stability, basically. In any case, Hamlet already feels, as Marcellus will, um, later, on, will later say that um, something is rotten in the state of Denmark. We also see that his mother's hasty remarriage has shattered his opinion of womanhood. Frailty, thy name is woman, he cries out famously in this scene. A mo motif that will develop through his unravelling romantic relationship with Ophelia and his deteriorating relationship with his mother. They both deteriorate very quickly. His soliloquy about suicide, oh, that this no too, too solid flesh would melt thought and resolve itself into a Jew, ushers in what will be a central idea of the play. Suicide. It's a huge bit of the play, by the way. Like, mainly the biggest idea of the play is suicide. Uh, the world is painful to live in, but with, within the Christian framework of the play, if one commits suicide to end that pain, one damns oneself to eternal suffering in hell. The question of the moral vi valid... Vi I can't say that word, but you know what I mean of suicide is an unbearingly painful world will haunt the rest of the play. It reaches the height of its urgency in the most famous line in all of English literature, to be or not to be, that is the question. In this scene, Hamlet mainly focuses on the appalling conditions of life railing against Claudius's court as an unweeded garden that grows to seed things rank and gross in nature, possess it merely. Throughout the play, we watch the gradual crumbling of the beliefs on which Hamlet's worldview has been based. Already in this first soliloquy, religion has failed him and his warped family situation can offer him no solace. So, Hamlet's a bit like, I'm 30, I've come back from uni, my father's dead, and I've got this new father that is my uncle and my mother's married him and it's just really fucked up. I'm done with life, this is it. And uh, yeah, so that's essentially what Hamlet's feeling, but also he wants redemption for his father's death, of course. But um, join me in a couple of weeks for when we go on to scene three. 
supposed to be scene four. I can't remember. But there you go. So I'll see you guys um, in another for another video. See you then. Bye.